Hello and good morning everybody. Today we're going to look a little bit at how to get data into our deep learning system. So for all intents and purposes, this is a very, very quick and dirty introduction to pandas. Now, this is by no means a good one. And for that, you should really go to the 10 minutes guide to pandas on the pandas website. It will definitely take you more than 10 minutes to actually read through it, but it's awesome. So do yourself the favor and read that. Now, if you want to continue watching, well, let's have a look at how you can actually read a little data set, do some basic pre-processing, and then, well, we'll do interesting things with it. Anyway, so the things that we need to do is, first of all, we need to create some data, and here I'm actually going to create the data explicitly, right? So this is just a small text file, and it has columns country, county, rooms, price, and size, and yeah, okay, this is Bay Area related, and these are some fantasy random numbers. In any case, I create that file and just write it to disk. Okay. And now the next thing I need to do is I need to actually read this. The cool thing about pandas is that it's really good when it comes to reading CSVs. And all I have to do is just PD read CSV. And this reads the file into what's called a data frame. And let's actually have a look at the data frame first. So keep in mind what we had here. So this was basically a comma separated values. So this is state of the art technology from spreadsheets from 30, 40 years ago. In any case, this is still a rather useful format. In any case, there's this format and we've now read it in. Now let's have a look at what this data frame actually looks like. So let's print it out. And voila, we actually get something rather pretty looking. Namely, it's prettily formatted and we have columns like county, rooms, price and size. We have rows numbered and we have the appropriate entries uh, where you know, if it's Santa Clara County or Santa Cruz, we have it. And if not, then, well, the county is not available. Or if these are numbers, it's not the number. Okay. Because maybe not for all houses, we know the number of rooms. And the really cool thing is you can actually access this in a way as if you were to access a matrix, except that those things actually have names. And by the way, you can also access it by the integer lo location, in which case you have instead of lock, I lock. But if you request data lock one to three, so I get basically rows one and two, right? So this is standard, you know, array indexing. And I want to get the columns, rooms and price. It'll print that out. And furthermore, data actually can access its columns through individual variables. So this is the really nice thing. So that data.county is now the variable that contains all the things in the county here and zero will just give me the first element. So what we should see is basically rooms and price here for the first, for the second and third row. And then afterwards, just Santa Clara. Okay, let's see whether this happens. It's pretty neat. So, why is this good? Because it makes for really readable code because it's so much, you're so much less error prone if you, you know, sum, you know, over the number of rooms as opposed to overall the entries in column number 29. For this tiny little example, it doesn't make so much difference, but if you have large code, this makes the code a lot more resilient. Furthermore, if somebody decides to swap some columns, well, your code might still work, whereas otherwise it will surely give you something incorrect. Okay, so let's see what happens next. So let's actually first see what we have in pandas. And so this data frame allows me to describe things. So D types is data types and county is an object because it doesn't really know what to do with it. Rooms are, you know, in this case, a floating point number because I set rooms to 2.0, which is 
dumb, but whatever. Price is an integer and size is an integer. We'll deal with that later. And yep, that's really all that there is in my data frame. And now for the variables where it makes sense, namely rooms, price and size, it actually gives me statistics, right? It tells me, you know, how many of those variables I actually have. Rooms I only have two because, well, there were only two cases where the rooms were available. And then it gives me the mean standard deviation mean and the appropriate quantiles and does that for the price and size too. It's kind of funny to do this on two observations. So, you know, you get the 25 and 75% quantile by just, you know, appropriately interpolating. So I probably wouldn't put too much trust into that for this tiny little data set, but in general, this is super useful for data ingest. So if you're dealing with tabular data and you want to know a little bit what's going on and you want to post-process it manually, this is it. Okay, it's really good for productivity. Okay, now we have a couple of cases where we have missing data. So um, let's actually first go and, you know, split the data sets into inputs and outputs because we want to estimate the price from the output. Uh, from the inputs. Okay, we can do that. By the way, we could have also done the following thing, right? We could have also set outputs is data dot price. That would have worked just as well as data log price. And the only reason why we did it the other way around is because it looks a little bit more consistent, but there's nothing to prevent you from doing this. In any case, there we go. So we have for the room still an AN and for the county we still have an A and we need to fill this in. Furthermore, um, there is no a priori similar similarity between Santa Clara and Santa Cruz, except that they both share Santa. And yeah, okay, from that you can probably infer that it has some Spanish heritage in it somewhere, uh, but that's about all. Um, and yeah, obviously you can't infer that the city of Santa Claus has the same heritage. So we'll just need, well, basically one hot encodings. So we'll do that and we'll encode NA also as one hot. So to indicate that something's missing. So this is a slightly more complex operation here. So the first thing I'm going to do is we are going to turn the county variables into dummies. So that's this part here. So we'll basically get, you know, three categories, namely Santa Clara, Santa Cruz and not available. Secondly, I'm going to go and identify for which variables, in this case, I know that rooms have some missing parts, are not uh, a number. And the easiest way to check whether something is, is NAN is you compare the object to itself. And so for anything else than a not a number, you get truth. And for whenever the room is missing, you get false. I could have done that for everything, but that would not give me very meaningful vectors. So just for the purpose of conciseness, I only do that to the rooms. Then I go and replace the not available entries. So fill now, fill NA, not available, and I fill it with the corresponding means. And it does that for columns. So I'm filling all the columns with the mean values whenever an entry is missing. But this is also why I had to preserve before in missing rooms the information as to you know which variables are missing. And then I go and concatenate my now cleaned up inputs with the indicator variable, variable that the rooms are missing. And I convert that to float64. In the end, okay, you print this. So it's not 
very complicated, but this is the kind of operation that you might end up doing in practice when you're doing some data wrangling. Okay. And so now what you can see is that for the two cases where, you know, the number of rooms was available, namely we get three and four, as you would expect it, but also you get the mean imputation, right? So whenever you don't know what the actual room is, right? So in this case, the average number of rooms is, you know, three and a half. Of course, that makes no sense, uh, but Okay, well, poor pandas doesn't know. This is all nicely, you know, the size was properly available. And here we have a dummy variable. And maybe I should have renamed that into something else, but it's zero whenever the rooms were actually missing. And it's one whenever it's not. Okay, so compare that to those entries over here and you can see that this just indicates whenever there was a mean imputation. Well, why would you care? Because when the information about rooms is not missing at random, let's say for instance, anybody who has more than 10 bedrooms would be too embarrassed to report it. So they'll just not report the number of rooms. So therefore not knowing the number of rooms tells you that it's either a shack that doesn't have a separate bedroom or it's or I think it's called efficiency nowadays, or it's an absolute gorgeous mansion where the owners are too embarrassed to display their, well, opulence in the number of rooms. Okay. In terms of county, so what we did is remember we turned this into dummy variables, get dummies. And so this is what happened. So now we have three different values for county. So we have county NA. We have County Santa Clara and we have County Santa Cruz. And so this way we get in the Santa Clara column information as to the Santa Clara-ness of, you know, that house. And not very surprisingly, you can see it's one in one place and zero throughout the rest. And likewise, the Santa Cruz-ness of a room can be indicated here. And for whenever we don't know where things are, well, that's what this column stands for. Okay, so this should give you a bit of an idea as to what can be done with using pre-processing in pandas. And so now we actually have a rather nice array. We just now need to convert it into something that, for instance, PyTorch can deal with. And that's very easy. Because all we do now is, I need to turn this off, I suppose. We import torch and then we just import torch tensor. So it's just a, our standard tensor constructor. And now for the inputs, which is a data frame. So torch cannot, PyTorch cannot deal directly with pandas data frames because it has some other metadata here, or at least not in this direct tensor constructor, but you can just dump out the values. So inputs.values and outputs.values will do just fine. So if we execute this piece of code, we'll get something very nice, namely exactly what we would have expected. Here we have one tensor that contains all the data and there we get you know, a tensor that contains um, just the labels. So if you've done something like z equals torch tensor, this would, hmm. this would have also worked. Well, that's convenient. Let's see, would that have worked for the inputs too? Yes. See, this is where things go wrong because it doesn't know what to do with a data frame. So it's smart enough to deal with a vector, not smart enough to deal with a data frame without some extra help. So given that this is the slightly safer option, if you don't want your code to break for no good reason. And with that, we're done with the data loading and input 
section. You should really watch the 10 minutes panda section because that has a lot more information to it. So go to the pandas website, look at the 10 minutes tutorial, then dive into it much more deeply. This is probably a really worthwhile investment of your time as a data scientist. And with that, thank you very much and see you tomorrow.